She was pretty, popular, and likable, so it's not surprising that a young man might have struck up a conversation with her in the park that day. Was he someone she knew from her childhood, or was she hitchhiking that day? This is a story of Carol Sue Claver, the Kentucky teenager whose murder was solved more than 40 years after her death. Hi friends, I'm Katie, and this is Katie Does Crime. Thank you for joining me for the first time if you're new here, and hello to the usual rapscallions and reprobates. Please consider subscribing or joining me on Patreon if you'd like to hear more true crime stories. We're going to be releasing new videos early to patrons without ads as a thank you for all of the support. Today's case will absolutely shock you because it's a totally solved case with no weird twists nor questions left open at the end. If you're one of my regulars, you know that I don't always cover the crimes that tie up nice and neat at the end, but today I'm giving you a break. Sit back, relax, and let justice be served. Born November 28, 1959, Carol Sue Kleber was about to become a senior in high school. The year, 1976. The place, Fort Wright, Kentucky. It was a small town of about 4,500 people, but it sits just a few miles from the Ohio border and is considered part of greater Cincinnati. Carol was pretty, popular, a musician who started learning piano at five years old before taking up guitar and other instruments. She played violin in the school's string ensemble. In 1968, she played a recital at the Taft Museum for the Ohio Music Teachers Association, so it seems like she must have been the sort of student her teacher wanted to show off. Likewise, her family said that she was funny, modest, and the type of person who had empathy for others. She volunteered her time at a local nursing home. Carol went out to dinner on June 4th, 1976. It was about 5.30 p.m., and she was headed for a restaurant called Zeno's in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Cincinnati. To me, Hyde Park is the frou-frou part of Cincy and not where I would expect a 16-year-old to hang out. But I found one forum post where someone was fondly remembering the hot brown sandwich served there and how younger teenagers weren't allowed in the special back room. Now, I don't know what was happening in that back room, but apparently the restaurant was a teen hangout known for inventing the Zenover. It's basically a pepperoni calzone, but because it's more of a tube than a moon, it was known as the Italian egg roll. And I'm sorry, this is not important to the case at all, but I just love local food traditions. So that's where Carol was headed in June 1976. We don't know exactly what happened, but 14 hours after she left home, Carol's body was found by a passing motorcyclist. She was in a ditch about 17 miles south of her home in a town called Walton, Kentucky. Carol had been strangled with her own chain necklace and beaten to death with something blunt. She was wearing only an off-white blouse and her bra. She had been assaulted. Authorities thought that she had probably been killed somewhere else and then moved there, a mile and a half off Route 25. The only clue was in a gray car. Carol had been out riding her bike when she returned home in this car with a young man at the wheel. A neighbor spotted her pulling her bike from the trunk and taking it to the house while the young man waited. He was about six feet tall and slim. Carol changed into that off-white blouse and some dress pants, and off they went. Her family said she was independent, not the type to let them know exactly where she was going and who she was going with. When she didn't return home that night, they thought she must have decided to spend the night with a friend. But when a body was found in Boone County the next day, Carol's brother saw the news report, and the family called the authorities. Carol's other brother went to identify the body. In her obituary, Carol is listed as the daughter of Mrs. Raymond R. Renneker and the late Daniel H. Kleber, so it seems her dad had died and her mom had remarried by the time she was 16. This was at a time when there was a string of unsolved murders in the area, 11 of them to be exact, going back to June 1975. Multiple young white girls and women had been stabbed and found nude, just like Carol was. The Cincinnati Post says, most had problems at home with their parents or with their spouses, and I wonder if Carol was included in that. Her father had suffered from heart problems and died too young, and her mom had brought a new man into the household. Many of the victims were also known to hitchhike. Was that young man in the gray car someone who had spotted Carol riding her bike and offered her a ride home and a trip up to Cincinnati for an Italian egg roll? Her mom said she told Carol a million times not to get into a car with a stranger. Investigators in the case did everything they could to find and collect evidence. They had the eyewitness report from that neighbor and were looking for a sandy-haired young man driving a gray Chevrolet Monte Carlo or Pontiac Grand Prix. But using DNA from crime scenes to establish the identity of suspects wouldn't really be a thing for another 10 years. There wasn't much to go on. A 28-year-old man named Larry Ralston was being considered as a suspect a year later in 1977 when he was charged with four counts of aggravated murder. 
His victims were women who had similarly disappeared and then were found assaulted and left beside Rose near Cincinnati. His name had been discovered in the address book of one of the victims, but authorities couldn't find any connection to Carol and said they weren't hopeful it was their guy. That same year in December, an anonymous person sent a typed letter to the Cincinnati Post calling himself Mr. Open Case. The person wrote, Some of those things I read about these cases in the paper aren't very exact, like the murder of Miss Carol Sue Kleber on Friday, June 4th, 1976. I can tell you all about her. She did not die after midnight. Like I said, she died shortly after 8 p.m. She was struck three times in the head with a nice lead pipe. Very nice pipe indeed. I may use the pipe again soon, ha ha. She did not put up a fight at all. That took the fun out of killing her. I just about messed up on that one. I shouldn't have let her take the bike home first. Some old meddling lady must have seen me take Carol home with the bike. The police said that they weren't sure what was used to beat Carol, just that it was a narrow, heavy, blunt instrument. The thing is that they were sure the object had been used more than three times, so they weren't placing much weight on the letter. All of the other information in it could have been made up or found in the newspaper. Investigators continued to work the case, some would say obsessively. One detective was said to carry a copy of the case report with him for the rest of his life. He had his eye on two suspects, but never had been able to prove their involvement. Just before he died in 2017, his former department assigned two new detectives to pursue local cold cases. They were to look into these two theories about Carol's killer in particular. What they found was that the two suspects definitely weren't involved. One of them had stolen a car similar to the one seen whisking Carol away that day, but DNA evidence cleared him. The second man had assaulted another woman next to the park where Carol was seen talking to a man before her death, and he was known to travel to Carol's area of Kentucky for work, but DNA also ruled him out. Still, the detectives were actually grateful to prove who didn't do it on their path to find out who did. Six years would pass before there would be another break in the case. In March 2023, the detective working it went to Carol's brother's house, the brother who had lived with that memory of going to identify Carol's body more than four decades prior. The detective said he would tell Carol's brother as much or as little as he wanted to know. Her brother wanted to know it all. DNA had been extracted from a hair collected from Carol all of those years before and had been sent off to Othram Labs. Analysis of the DNA was made possible by a grant from Season of Justice, a nonprofit that funds agencies and families to help solve cold cases or bring awareness to them. And this genetic genealogy lab, in fewer than two months, was able to identify the potential murderer. Link Media of Northern Kentucky reports that detectives went to visit the suspect's adult daughter to confirm the match, and to say the least, she was shocked. She didn't have a relationship with her father, but certainly never expected that the unsolved murder of a young woman was part of his past. The killer's name was Thomas William Dunaway. At the time of Carol's death, he was 19 years old and had been living just a mile and a half from Carol's home in Kentucky. His house was near a park where Carol had been seen days before talking to a young man who matched his description. It's possible Dunaway and Carol knew each other from elementary school, but it's also possible that the social and likable Carol just started talking to a stranger in the park. One week after a newspaper article put everyone on the lookout for his car and a man matching his description, Dunaway got rid of his 1973 Monte Carlo and enrolled in the U.S. Army. Six months after Carol's death, he went AWOL and killed again, this time a man also in Northern Kentucky. He was picked up in South Carolina when he burned a Chevrolet Impala and was found to have an illegal sawed-off shotgun in his possession. Dunaway was sentenced to life in prison but was eligible for parole after six years and only served seven. And on December 28, 1990, he died from a heart attack at only 33 years old. Thomas Dunaway died in 1990, so they're unable to formally indict him. But the Commonwealth attorney says based on the investigation, If Mr. Dunaway were alive, we would present this case to the grand jury seeking a charge of murder against Mr. Dunaway for the murder of Carol Sue Claver. It's about the best we can do. Carol's brother says he's sorry in a way to find out that Dunaway is already dead and will never face charges nor more prison time. He said if he ever found out who it was, he had some rather unchristian plans for his sister's killer. Her death had left the family with a lingering wound, a vague darkness somewhere down inside and the fear that it could happen again. Carol's brother would call his own son incessantly out of fear whenever the boy was out too late with friends. Carol's death had left a mark. But the one thing he can take comfort in is this. When investigators went to collect more DNA to enter into the CODIS database to see if Dunaway committed any additional crimes, it was Dunaway's body they exhumed, not his sister's. 
Carol's brother said, there is a little bit of justice. You're going to disturb somebody's remains? Dig him up. And they did. Carol Sue Claber has now been marked solved on the Boone County Sheriff's cold case list. When we sat and told him that we knew who the killer was, and then we shared with him who the killer was, you could physically just see his body just kind of relax. And he said, I already feel so much closure. And that's the end of this completely solved case with a satisfying, if not perfect, resolution. Does it bring comfort when you know the killer has met their end this way, or do you want to see them serve their time? As always, please let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm just a true crime fan like you are, and I really appreciate you taking a chance on me. Please like and subscribe to my channel if you like spending this time together. I'd be so appreciative. Until next time, I'm Katie, and this has been Katie Does Crime.